I'd like to welcome you to the Humana Festival and this conversation amongst the festival's directors and our wonderful moderator, Kwame Kwayama, the Artistic Director of Centre Stage Theatre in Baltimore. When we were discussing this year about the panels, one of the impulses was to put together a conversation uh, surrounding the topic of directing new plays. Uh, and that we wanted this year's panels to be really focused on theatre artists and their perspectives. So, um, here are the festival's directors, some of us, uh, talking about directing new work, the developing of new work, um, and we'll see how this goes. Um, and this morning's conversation is being live streamed on New Play TV, which is a peer-produced knowledge commons stewarded by Hal Brown, the Centre for the Theatre Commons. And if anyone in the audience would like to participate via Twitter, you can use the hashtag New Play, or if you'd like to follow the ongoing conversation surrounding the festival on Twitter over the next week, Check out at, actors, at ATL Louisville and look out for the hashtag Humanifest. And when we hand this over to questions from the audience, please use the mics, guys, and people will be moving around. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody to quickly introduce themselves. Good afternoon, my name is Kwame Kramer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Bugdale, and I directed Cry Old Kingdom by Jeff Augustine. I'm Lila Neugebauer, and I directed Oh Guru Guru Guru, or Why I Don't Want to Go to Yoga Class yeah. with You by Melody <laughs> Abaddon. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy Attaway. I directed Sleep Rock Thy Brain by Lucas Nate, Renick Roth, and Anne Washburn. Donna, I'd like to the Dell Shore by Sam Marks. Great, so please excuse me being inundated by technology, um, but I want to follow us on Twitter, so for all of those, uh, all of those at home uh, looking at us on live TV, uh, if you have my hashtag or the hashtag that, that of course Les spoke about, please do send questions uh, during the, when I open it all up. Hey, friend. And, um, and uh, please do, and, I, and I'll try and sneak the question in. I think as Les said, um, what we tried, we met downstairs, and we kind of went, ah, and then we had to kind of stop, because otherwise we'd have the whole discussion downstairs. Because um, we're all fascinated with each other, fascinated with each other's work, and their minds, and of course we're all fascinated. Um, uh, and so, <laughs> he says, for you. And, um, and so, really, what we're trying to do here, what we're going to try and accomplish, really, is I'm probably just going to fire off the first question. And then we're just going to speak to each other, really, and for the first 25 minutes, ask each other questions. And then after about 25 minutes, I'll bounce out to you guys, if that's okay. Is that okay within the house? <laughs> Great. Thank you. And I ask that because uh, five directors around the table um, we may not really kind of listen to anything that anybody else says. <laughs> so I want to make sure that you encourage me and encourage us. Say, remember you said on the first day of rehearsal that my role was the biggest. Um, <laughs> you were my center of my vision. Um, so I, I suppose I just want to kick off, and any of us can jump in, of course, and, and ask or say, Kwame, that was a really crap question, and, um, and rephrase it, and that would be fine. But the first thing that, that, that springs to my mind is, do we approach directing a new play any differently than if it were a classic or a revival that we saw five years ago? What, what, what goes through our minds when, that, when it lands on our desk? And I'm going to spin the mic that way. <laughs> it's going to go to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, you're asking me to review my choice. <laughs> <laughs> like, just go a little bit stage left, okay. rather than... Okay. I would say that I, I have been very fortunate to spend most of my career directing new plays. I am, maybe, I, I think yes, for the first time in, in my career, 
this summer directing a play that might deign to be considered a classic, which is, wait for it, Steel Magnolias. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, so I feel like I'm going to uh, approach every play like a new play for the rest of from, from my whole career, um, because I was lucky to, to mostly cut my teeth here at Actors Theatre, um, approaching contemporary plays and new plays. Um, for me, the most exciting part of that is that I feel like my main objective as a director is to is to dive in and figure out what the playwright, what the message the playwright is trying to send to me. What is what is the message the playwright needs to send to me so that I can then interpret it through my team and show it to the audience. Um, which is a very exciting thing to do with playwrights in the room, with a playwright in the room. But equally exciting, I think, to look at a play by an elevated playwright that was first produced five years ago. Right. So. Uh, I mean, I, I think that you, um, I think that you approach new and old plays uh, basically the same, fundamentally the same. And I think the great thing about having a writer in the room is, um, like, that you get to cheat in a way because you um, you can ask uh, someone else, you know, is this scene any good at all? Um, <laughs> is, it, is it, you know, is it working? Um, and you're not you're not uh, alone in your in your crisis of, of trying to make something. That's interesting because I, I I think that when you mention the word cheat, I find that very interesting because sometimes with a living writer in the room, you can go and that line's not working. You can just think, do you want to change it maybe? <laughs> um, whereas whereas with you know with the classic piece, it's on you. And you go, I, I had that earlier on this year, I was doing uh, Arthur Miller's adaptation of Enemy of the People. And there was a full stop, and I know this sounds really myopic, but there was like a full stop on a kind of word that I went, it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. I can't get on the phone, I can't say, will you take it out? And three days later, the actors and myself, we actually discovered that it did work. And I know in my heart of hearts that if a new writer had been in the room, I would just have been convinced, I would have just said, it doesn't work. What do you think, what, what else can we possibly do? Yeah, I find that, that that question of like, what is my job and what is the writer's job? I found I was doing a lot of new plays for many years and then said, you know what, I need to start putting some classics in where I know that every problem I have to solve, because it is, it's easy to suddenly go like, we have to take a look at this, we have to take a look at this. And that now I find I ask those writers questions of changing much later in the process, because I fear that I'm just letting it do the work for me. Though I think it's on. It's good. Yeah, it's good. It's on. Okay. <laughs> Though I think something that is just um, occurring to me as you're saying that is I think there's this sort of funny assumption that when the writer is dead, the play works. Like I think, <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, well, they're gone, so they work. And I think, um, and I think it's funny because right, every play would want a new play as we've done for the first time, and um, you know, hopefully, many of the plays that we all direct the first productions of will be done done a hundred years from now. The planet is still here. Not covered in water. But, um, you, know, you, know, I, you know, I do the I'm sorry, that just got very late. But you know what I'm saying? And, and so I think, I think what's interesting is like you read some early, early works. Like I just, I did a, a staged reading of this bizarre Chekhov play, The Wood Demon, which is like an early draft of Gagnon. And this thing is so weird. I mean, it's so deeply, deeply weird. And you see the sort of etchings of Vanya inside it, which is sort of fascinating because so much of it just doesn't work at all. But it illuminates for you moments in Vanya that, that retain a kind of bizarre elliptical strangeness. Um, and, and to me, that's sort of thrilling because I think you're always sort of going to go, I think that to me, like this idea of sort of what works feels like this continually elastic thing that we're kind of reinterrogating in terms of just like, what is that moment about for you? Um, or like, how are you choosing to illuminate that moment? Feels like an ongoing conversation, whether the writer is alive or dead. I, I just want to let you know that, that when you spoke about the planet, that uh, our Twitter feed went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about, about plays and new writing and the, and the environment. But hey, this is... <laughs> Less. Um, um, do I think they're different? Um, and on a personal process level of, of how I approach them, no. It all seems to me the same uh, job. Um, 
I think I, I, I personally, I think I, I mean, I have a very high level of ignorance about classic plays. Um, probably because my career has been based around this, and it's somehow in my DNA of, of how, I, I just have a kind of big need to do them. I, I'm not quite sure that I have the same need to do classic plays. Um, and I think I'm, um, I think directing is quite lonely. It's, um, uh, and I, with, and not having, having a dead writer, I don't find particularly helpful. <laughs> So, part of me feels that the conversation isn't happening. Yes. Um, but the actual process and how I prepare for it, uh, I think it's the same. And I, and I, I, I think I, uh, there's an intimidation factor for me in doing classic plays, because I think people think that these refined objects, you know, that they're like perfectly polished, stones, or, or, the, or it's perceived somewhere as them being like that, and I actually think they're as ungainly and awkward uh, as often as a new player. So that um, I personally find Shakespeare completely perplexing, and they hop, they're a real mishmash of stuff. Or I, uh, several years ago, did the Glass Menagerie of Berkeley, and thought, well, this is just very strange. Your scenes stop. Do you know what I mean? They don't end, they just stop. It's as if the dialogue is the dialogue ran out, and then we just have to go. So, um, <laughs> um, I think I find more pleasure, personal pleasure, in doing a new play. And I think, I, I, um, I think it's Cartier Bresson, the photographer, I think it is, who somebody asked him why did he photograph, said he photographed because he wanted to see what the thing looked like once he photographed. Um, at a kind of personal and uh, um, level, I, I actually want to do the thing, the sensible, this is real analysis, <laughs> this is shaming. Um, I want to do the thing to see what will happen to me during the process of doing it. I, uh, this part of me wants to see which version of Les Waters will appear at the end of it, uh, and what bit of me is going to go into play during the process of putting it together. Um, but guys, let's be real. <laughs> Um, I mean, is it a really good career choice, directorially, to direct new plays? And, I, let, me, and let me frame it in that we all know, you know, at the end of the day, no one knows what you've been through in your process. No one has anything to compare it to. You know, they don't know if you took that actor from that very teary, melodramatic interpretation to this beautiful, nuanced thing. And of course, I know none of you said that about any of the performances that you had to negotiate. Um, nobody knows what. Nobody knows, you know, the decisions you made with your fellow collaborators. We are judged by the three mistakes we make, rather than the fifteen thousand good ones that added to the process. If you do a classic, everybody knows it. Everybody can see your work. They can see the director's hand. Um, I know for me, I when I'm directing a new play, I don't want my hand to be evident. Is it a good career choice? Should we be wanting to show off so that that Broadway producer can come and say, or that big rep can say, yes, I love your hand. Come and do this great big show. I don't know who wants to take that, if that makes any sense at all. Mm. 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 I think there's like some like mid, is it, is it midwifery? Is that the actual mm. word? Yeah. Is it what? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, 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 there was no gender. <laughs> I, no, no, but I guess I guess what I mean is, it's, or, or the um, the line uh, in Beckett, a stride of the grave and a difficult birth. Like I think that all that if we're trying to do these new things and they're brand new, um, it's, there's sort of like pie on your face uh, frequently, and um, that you uh, that the ego has to somehow s step to the side in, in, a, in a certain way, so that. Um, it's, I think that that's what's so pleasurable uh, about it is that you, you get to walk sort of in tandem with, with someone else.
almost like you know holding hands. Um, and that, uh, I, I think whether you think it's that or not, it, it inevitably is that. So, um, anybody else? I, I find it really pleasurable to, to be able to take myself out of the process more. Do you know, I feel like as, as a director of new plays, my primary job is to listen well and, and to get out of the way. Do you know? And that, that is very pleasurable for me. My playwrights are here, my dramaturg is here, a lot of my actors are here, do you know, like that. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to get out of the way and let these very smart people do their work. What about... Because the cover tape, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, well, it's also annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, is a, there is an invisibility factor to it, which is um, sort of great on one level, because a lot of us, mm -hmm. although we're directors, are quite shy. Um, but you do become, yeah, it can be annoying because you're invisible. Do you know what I mean? I mean, if you and I were to do. Uh, a felon, somebody would be able to kind of be able to see what we've done. And, and because um, that's usually not happening with a new play, I mean, well, it isn't if you're doing it for the first time. Um, you can feel that one's director <coughs> worse, um, that you've been, you're sort of disappearing out of the equation. Well, that's the only negative side of it, yeah. but and sometimes that negative negative side is completely overwhelming. But um, I'm going to shut up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I mean, all that I was thinking, and I, you know, I think um, many of us are at this table because we're people who are. Um, I don't want to speak. But I think who are, who are people who are sort of interested in a, in a kind of work in which our hand is invisible, in which we're creating an event that feels somehow actor-driven. Um, uh, but the funny thing that I'm just sort of thinking about as we're talking about this is that I actually think in any kind of work, I think people who come to, I think directing is one of the most difficult things to, for, for many people to perceive when you watch work. Whether it's, I mean, I think when, in the case of significant auteurship, like, you know, I think you go to an Ivo Van Hover show, I'm like, you know what that guy's doing. Um, but um, but I, I think it's, I think it can be a difficult thing to perceive. And, and all that I did want to say is that, you know, as a person who has mostly done new work as well, I think when I go to see a show that Les has directed, or, you know, that I, that I see um, Annie Kaufman direct, I, I do feel that I'm, I see what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's a part of it is sort of about um, the lens through which you're looking for the director's work, um, and the question of what constitutes an invisible hand, I, I just think is also, you know, one of perception. Talk to me, guys, um, about working with playwrights, having playwrights in the room. And I'm taking off my playwright hat now. <laughs> as, uh, um, you know, in a kind of way, we've all said rather beautifully, oh, it's wonderful working with new plays. We're shepherds of visions, where we put our invisible hand in there to help them see their vision and help them. Uh, but it's not always like that. Talk to me about the great times of work having a playwright in the room and some of the less great times. <laughs> and and, and <laughs> without the playwright, I'm talking not about anything here that's not here at all. Going reaching right back into the nether regions of our minds. But, but, but I'm, I'm really interested in that time because there are times when you go, I can see this very clearly. And if you do this, this, and this, this will work. And a playwright, putting my playwright hat on, says, no, my vision is this. I'm, I'm amid this now. I'm, I'm amid it all the time. And, you know, donning on the different hats. And uh, talk, to, talk to me about how we negotiate that, guiding the rewrite, guiding the vision. Um, it's in my background. I mean, uh, not being of this country. Um, and training, if you could call it that, <laughs> at the Royal Court <laughs> Theatre, where it was, um, the, the writers had the right to be in the room. I mean, they claimed the right. That's, that's what it was. We were doing new plays. They were expected to be there. They expected to be there. So I've never had to kind of negotiate this curious thing, which I think, you know, people, like, should the writer be in the room or not? They were always going to be in the room, and it was their play, and I don't write. I have no, nothing to say as a writer. 
I would have nothing to say as an actor. I would have nothing to say as a designer. So I, what I can say is um, going through somebody else's work or running alongside it. Um, and the tricky bits, what are the tricky bits? I mean, I think there's a misplaced notion about collaboration uh, that in a room we should all get on all of the time. Uh, that would be nice, you know, it would be also nice to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, but it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So I, uh, and I worked for years with the theatre group in England, John Stark, who are most famous, if they're famous at all anymore now, is for Carol Churchill's Cloud Nine, which was the most intense collaboration I've ever been through, and was uh, weeks and weeks and weeks of really bloody fighting. Mm. between people a lot of people in a room with a lot of opinions and a lot of opinions about the text and there were times uh, where somebody in the room would dig in and you have to back off you know I mean there were bits where Carol just said yes I know you want that but I'm not writing that <laughs> that's that, or Max, who was the director, saying, it's going to be like this. So I, I um, and that could be viewed negatively, you know, it's like, oh, that, that thing. It was actually really exciting and really risky, and a lot of very smart people in a room with a lot of talent throwing it around. Um, or throwing it at. Yeah, and there's, a, I, I mean, it's, I think, I think, Directors have to respect on new work that the, 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 you know, the play has been through a process and somebody's written it and somebody's chosen these words and wants to say this. And, you know, sometimes the bumpy bits will be, you know, that what's happening in the rehearsal room or the bit I intensely dislike is when you leave the rehearsal room and go on stage for the first time um, is, is that... Um, uh, that for a director, that first day in the room is like writing a first draft. Mm -hmm. That's that's it. I um, just want to say that someone in the audience just wanted to ratify what you said uh, via Twitter. Said yes that we have forgotten to fight in the rehearsal room. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's I think that's it. Let's go ahead. I simply wanted to echo um, uh, that I feel my best work comes from a place of healthy and rigorous creative tension and conflict. <laughs> Which is not to say that I, I stoke the fires of tension at all, but simply to say that I want to work with people, writers, designers, and actors who have strong opinions, um, and who, that they're sort of rigorously working out with me in conversation. Um, and that I think successful collaboration doesn't mean that it looks like everyone's being nice all the time. Um, I also create work with a company, um, and we've, I've probably gotten into the worst fights with those people, worse fights than I've gotten with members of my family. Um, and we sort of managed to get through them. Um, and I think, um, to me, the only sort of danger of um, creative conflict is that if it, becomes, if it begins to feel personal, you can shut down and, and stop listening. Um, so I think the question is sort of how do you stay open in the face of what you hope is kind of useful uh, creative conflict that I, I think is sort of inevitable. I found too that it, it uh, in the best circumstance, that it makes me braver, that frequently, like, I know my things, where it's like, oh, I want things to go fast, I want things to do this, and then I've been in the room with writers who will say, like, it would be great if that pause was actually a pause. You know, like, bravely go in silence, bravely go into the things that I don't naturally, that naturally make me super uncomfortable, which I find is actually really good that each play I do with I have someone else in the room that can actually say to me, like, what about the thing you don't want to look at? That a lot of times, you know, we hide from the things we are afraid of in ourselves. That it's useful, I find, when I have a writer who can call me out of that. <laughs> um, it would be remiss of me, I, mean, I think with six directors around the table, to not ask us all to actually just shuffle along one seat. Because I've just got a tweet that says, as much as it's lovely to see your face, Kwame, the camera, I'd like to see the faces of the other panelists. So why don't we just move <laughs> <swing> around? <laughs> Because the camera's there, and if I go here, actually, then I think there's even more. Oh, well, there we go. Let's do one more, and then the camera can actually see that. Howard, I hope that you see that I pay my ticket to my little
It's not just here for sure. Um, <laughs> guys, I'm, you know, again, I say this, it's really easy for us to say, you know, tension is great in the room, and I think it is. Tension is great to have in the room. It's, it's great to say that we're listeners and we have to listen. But talk to me about that time, and we've all had it, and of course not here, but we've all, all had it, when you actually are doing this new play and you know it's going to be a turkey. <laughs> you know you go, okay, I'm halfway through this, and I don't think I can direct us out of this. I, I don't think I can direct us out of it. At what point, what did you do then? <laughs> Apart from, well, I would just go to the airport and fly back to England. But, um, <laughs> 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 I mean, that's my, that's our way out. But I mean, you've got nowhere to run. <laughs> I mean, talk to me, I mean, if you've not had that in your life, that's wonderful. But if you have, how do you negotiate being in that room, motivating those actors, getting the play to be the best that it could possibly be, and even then preparing the writer for what we know might be a little bit of a rough ride. Has anybody had that? Yeah, oh, I've had it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the worst, because uh, I, I fully drank the Kool-Aid. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're in the room, you're making it work, you're like, this is going great, this is going great, and it was first preview. And first preview, and suddenly when you have that moment of seeing the play with other people in the room, and you're like, oh, all those people see, oh, no. And I suddenly <laughs> saw the actual play that was happening, which was like, oh, this is not working in the way that we have been telling ourselves that it is. And it was a really tricky process, because I think we all discovered it very late in the game, and then had to go back into rehearsal and say, okay, well, how are we gonna try to fix this in a way that feels active and feels of what we're doing, but it, it, I didn't see it. I didn't see it coming in, it blindsided me seeing it through other people's eyes. Um, I, I, I'm not sure really what the answer is to this. I mean, I've certainly directed shows and thought I've got it wrong, that, it, that actually I've gone in the wrong direction with something and it's come really late. <laughs> in the process and it, uh, yeah i've done stuff where i thought you know who really should be directing this is that person um, um well there's always somebody in the room who's who's carrying there's always somebody in the room who has more knowledge about the thing than anybody else do you know what i mean i mean i um I was thinking previews that, that something will happen and you watch actors and think they know they now know more about this thing than I'm ever gonna know because I don't perform and I'm not in that dialogue with an audience. Um, I try and identify who that person is, you know, and and I um, or ask the people in charge in the theatre for the advice on it, yeah. uh, which I um, think as a director is sometimes very difficult to do because you you have to cope um, and people have put you in charge whatever that means of the thing and you have to fulfill that obligation and I think um, particularly my early career I was so frightened of doing that that somebody would kind of think oh god he's hopeless um, which I was, so I didn't ask, and there are people there to ask. I, I, I learned that relatively early, but actually I learned it when I was a playwright before I became a director. And a rather wonderful director in Britain called Angus Jackson. And uh, congratulations on your Olivier nomination, in case you're watching. And, um, and, uh, and he, he called, we were doing a play at the National at the time, and he called Nick Heitner in very early in the rehearsal, like two weeks into a six or seven week process. And I was like, oh my God, you're exposing all of our weaknesses. And he said, no, I want him to tell me where I'm going wrong so I can fix it very quickly. Yeah. And that really helped me. I've carried that all the way through as a, a, as a jobbing director and now as an artistic director. I call other people into my process very early so I can see, they can identify the things that I don't see. Anybody else on, on that? Yeah, you go. You. I guess 
all I was in the zone is I also think you get this moment, um, you know, idea that you're having conversations with your designers all the way through. But the, I was going to speak to the idea of getting other people to take a look. <laughs> and I just think there's also this sort of the theater when you get your designers to be a, a part of the conversation, and I think you have a, a chance to begin to make the thing um, with a different set of tools. And or are going to permit you access to or framing of the thing in a way that maybe can address some of the things you're grappling with. Um, feels like a useful moment. Good. Um, I'm going to go out to the audience now, as I've been reminded, actually by the good old-fashioned hand-waving, rather than... <laughs> <laughs> Come on, now, nah, I've told you. Um, but actually, I'm going to go straight to... Um, actually, thank you. So if you grab uh, one or two of those, thank you. And guys, I'll put my mic around if anybody wants them. We've got two to answer those questions. Um, but even before I go to the audience, I'd like to acknowledge that the question that's probably about to be asked, or at least I'm edging you in that way, is Julie there. Well, Julie, Julie has asked a question on Twitter, and I'd like you to ask that first question. Oh, sure. I was, I was wondering... There's a mic coming to you right now. I'm not loud enough for all of you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you guys have been so articulate and awesome, and no one has actually talked about working with a dramaturg on a new play. And I'm wondering if you could address that a little bit. And I know you all know that I'm a dramaturg. Don't worry about hurting my feelings. I mean, <laughs> I'd actually love to have an honest answer on that. Who wants to take that? Thank you. So, this, is, this is actually what I was just about to say before when I let Lila go before me. Was, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll see what <laughs> That didn't come out the way I wanted to. <laughs> When, when I'm having doubts in the process, the, the first person I talk to is a dramaturg. That's, for me, the dramaturg is the person in the room who, um, way more than I can, can see from the audience's point of view. I feel like I, as a director, perhaps because I started as an actor, I, I tend to sort of lose myself in the world of the play really quickly and have a hard time stepping back and seeing it from the outside, seeing the whole thing from the outside. Um, and so that's one way in which I, I really, really depend on dramaturgs. And, and I will say, Julie, one piece of advice you gave me very early on relates also to a, a conversation we were having, is that when we were working on 359 with Marco, you came into the room and you were like, you two are being too nice to each other. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you. Anybody else want to chip in on that? Or should I go to another question? Let's go to another question. Thank you. Uh, where do I see a hand? I actually saw a hand directly behind. That was my question. That was your question. <laughs> Two for the price of one. I'm doing well here. Um, and while we're doing that, thank you. There's a, there's a question of that gentleman over there in the rather handsome grey sweater. <laughs> <laughs> At least I hope it is. But it's with, a, with a dash of brown. My mother, my mother will appreciate that. Excellent. <laughs> I recently saw a third or fourth production of Duncan McMillan's Lungs. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, it's a brilliant script, but it's also has it's 99.9% .9 dialogue, with virtually not even scene changes, not even the indication when there's a huge shift. That was achieved in its initial production in Washington, D.C., because Mr. McMillan was, in fact, in rehearsals. What I'm very curious about is when you get a script like that, and it's the third or fourth production, and you don't have any access to the playwright other than perhaps email, how do you cope? I don't know, maybe you embrace that, maybe you resent the fact that there's no help in there. How do you deal with a script when you don't have access to the playwright, but it's still a new work that's still finding its legs? Who wants to take that? Uh, well, I'll, let me jump in first, if I may. Um, I, I did see that production in DC, and it was wonderful. Um, I think, and again, using two hats, I think as a playwright, after the first or second production, once it's been acclaimed, in a kind of way as a playwright, it's fine for other people to interpret it in any which way, because you're already covered. You can, even if you fly in to see it, you can kind of go, well done, that was your mistake. Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> and here's my New York Times review to tell you that I was, I was one. <laughs> um, so you, there's a kind of, there, there are some playwrights who hold on to that, their work and interpretation of work to the grave. I, I, I tend to worry about that. I think you've already made your statement. I think directorially, I think one has to look at 
one's audience and where you are exactly. One, what part of the country you're in, what part of the town you're in. What is the test of that audience, of that particular playhouse? And then find one's own. Um, you know, I think, like Les said, I think like everybody said, every time you're, you're approaching a your play, it's that dual thing, uh, for me, of how to be invisible, but yet how to serve it. How to make it unique to my production but how to not bastardize it so that it looks like it's my interpretation of it. So I think there's a very delicate way of, of negotiating that. I, I did, had that with Mountaintop, which of course is having 19 productions around the world, and, and had to try and find my own interpretation of it that also served my audience in Baltimore, but also served primarily Katori's vision. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> In, in my other life, I have a little theater company called Theater 502, and we're, we, we do all second productions, regional premieres, and so I do this a lot. And we've actually done two of Lila's premieres now. Um, I know. So I think that uh, something you just said was really smart, and I, what I learned what, as we first started to do this is that I had this sort of like chip on my shoulder about not reading the press from the premiere productions, you know? Oh, well, I don't, I'm not going to do it how they did it, so I don't want to read the reviews, I don't want to look at the pictures, I don't want to see any of that. But I finally realized that was stupid, um, that there was a lot to be learned from looking at another director's interpretation without worrying about the, how it was going to color my own. Very good. Guys, um, while we look for the next question, let's move along so we get somebody else in close up. Uh, there's a question. <laughs> there's a question up there, please, if I can have a microphone. Thank you. There's a microphone coming to the gentleman up there in the rather smart blue blazer. Thank you. And uh, so it's just coming to you, just so that everybody at home can hear your question. Thank you so much for waiting. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'd like to get back to the description of a new play when it's a turkey. I think I get nervous hearing new work described that way. Um, one of the things I've come to learn about producing new work is that they're not all going to be successful in the first production. And I've come to accept, either as producing or directing, that sometimes failing makes the play even stronger for that even more important production, the second production. So, um, I'd be interested in hearing, um, can you take the fear out of failure when you're directing and working with a writer on a new work? Because I find that pretty scary, but yet exciting to fail and make the play stronger. Uh, Over to you, Les. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is my former life as a person from the Royal Court. Um, the, the court mantra was, we have the right to fail and it failed spectacularly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. Is this play taught anymore? I mean, Edward Bond wrote this extraordinary play called Save, which is one of the greatest plays ever written. It's really unpalatable. I mean, it has a scene that is, uh, uh, I mean, nauseating. Um, it's one of the greatest plays. It's recognized as one of the greatest plays in England, and it played 13%. Um, and was revived shortly after and played to like 20. And was revived because the theatre stood behind it and were champions. Um, I, um, uh, as a, uh, uh, to quote a line from Gannett, as a person with many problems, um, I, I have to say I was sort of addicted to the fear of it. I, I like it, I like the terror of it, um, I, I like not knowing where it's going. Um, yeah, I, th I, um, I don't like fear, but <laughs> I'm going to shut up because it's <laughs> I, 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 I like the, I, I like that thing of, of that you don't know what it is and it, and it could be, and it is, usually. I mean, things are messy. I mean, I wish we wouldn't think that a great play wasn't messy. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I like the ones that you that seep out of the edges of the thing, that, that isn't you can't put in a box or, or whatever. That's... I, I think it's interesting. I think the question is rather wonderful. In particular, what kind of playwright gets a second production? 
And uh, I think that's the risk. Invariably, if you birth it well, and it is received well, hence our fear, then it has the chance, you are giving it the legs, to have a second and a third production. If it's a new playwright and it's received badly, the chances are, are, are small. If it is a famous and a big-chested and broad-shouldered playwright that can have people believe in them and say, yes, I know it didn't work the first time, but we can just do production two, three, four, and five until it does work, then that's easier. I think it's, it's how one negotiates the fear of failure and, and, then, and then hope that it will, in fact, perpetuate that forward motion is, is terribly difficult to negotiate, because it's not in our hands. And so I'm terribly pleased that you as a producer are interested in the long game and not the short game. And how do we persuade others to do that? Not just the ones and twos. Thank you for that. Do I have, there's a question there for the gentleman there in the pink shirt, if I can get a microphone. At least it looks pink from the gel. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And I know I have my back to you, Matt, so you can't give me the wrap up, but I am looking at my, um, and I'm just so that the camera can just see you one more time. This <laughs> <laughs> is a, a bit of a, a follow up to the uh, last question. And in directing a new work, or maybe any work, do you ever consciously or unconsciously think about if I do this with this play, the audience will not like it and will react negatively, and even though it may be an element of the play itself, do you ever think in a new work, if we go in this direction, or if I make these decisions, nobody's going to come see the play, even though it's a good play? Who wants to take that? <laughs> Let me jump in and talk about somebody else, because I think it's a great question. Um, in, in my humble opinion, this is a question that comes before most artists of color that if I say this, will it alienate my majority, possibly majority audience? If I represent this truth, will it be accepted by the majority? And, or will it not be accepted and therefore confined to the, the dustbin of misinterpretation? Um, and I, it's, a, it's a wonderful dilemma that I certainly as an artist of color negotiate with every single line that I write, or every single line that I direct, or every character that I direct when, um, when directing a new piece. The, the, it, it is a very tough world negotiating the, the understanding of the majority of, for instance, America up until 2042. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would say too that I think, in sort of the same way Les was saying about like the, liking the messy plays, that I feel like when I go into something as a director, I'm thinking about how to best attack that, and I find it really dangerous for me to say like, oh, but will people like this? Because I'm not sure that I think my job is to do things that people will like, because I also think it's naive to think that I know what they'll like. And I think that then the majority becomes a sort of vague, beige thing. So I sort of say, like, well, what does this thing want? And then I'm going to try to do what the play wants. And then put it in front of people bravely. Which is terrifying, but I think better for the play. And for me. Uh, all that I was just going to add. Um, personally, I find that lately um, some of the work that I've been doing seems to challenge audiences based on... Um, experiments in form or style more than it does by virtue of its content, actually. Um, and um, and, and that, that has been a sort of interesting and challenging thing to negotiate. Um, and I guess my, my thought process is, has mostly to do with my sense of to what degree do I feel like that aspect of the play has integrity and is it pursuing something that I'm genuinely interrogating with interest and that I sort of can get behind and believe in and then hopefully I'm trying to find my way into that um, in order to illuminate it in a way that people who may be challenged by it from a formal perspective can ultimately in some way or another find their way into or be totally alienated by but maybe in a way that's useful as a theater experience. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because in a kind of way, I think that all that we've said makes total sense, but if it's a new playwright, their career depends on the decisions that we make. 
You know, it, we, we can intellectualize and go, yeah, well, it's okay. But that, you know, that playwright is sat there going, if this gets reviewed well, I can make a living and I can stop serving food at McDonald's. I can stop, you know, having to beg and write every application form that there's going. So what is our responsibility to make the play the best thing that it can be and give those writer, or that writer, the chance of, of existing in this most beautiful of worlds that we all exist in. I think I, I actually try to make them responsible for it, actually, in a way. Because, <laughs> because, well, no, because I mean, I think I think it's less about saying you know good, good and bad, and it's about saying like, look, these things are blueprints for life, right? They're blueprints for a kind of life that we're going to populate the stage with on this particular day. And so I want to try to understand as best I can what that brand of life is that a particular writer wants. And that, I feel like that is, that is all, that's all I can hold myself accountable for. Um, whether it's good or bad, I, you know, is it honest? Is it honest to what they want? And in the case of Saved, that's what he wanted. He wanted a, what he wanted there. Uh, can I just say thank you to Jamil Jude, who um, paid me a lovely compliment on Twitter. I won't self-aggrandize by reading it. Can we move, can we move? I want to do one more shift so we got everybody. So we get everybody in. Well, one, more, one more revolution. Of course, it shows my linearity as a director. I just keep us going in one way. But everybody, every director is like, no, I want us to cross. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's the choice we like. That's why you are who you are, sir. <laughs> There's a question over here. Thank you. Thank you. Curious about there, there, we always have debates about criticism and new work and new things get killed. But I'm curious because we're talking about directors and your roles. What is the effect of press on how you guys do your job? Sometimes I read reviews of new plays and I feel like the director is the scapegoat or the lead actor is the scapegoat, and it, it doesn't feel like a holistic conversation about the play because clearly the critic couldn't have been in the room the whole time to understand the process. So back to the beginning of the panel, you guys are about the invisible hand and what your role is. And I'm curious, we all love the reviews when they're good, right? We use them, we put them in our portfolio, and, and Kwame already you talked about your fabulous, you know, you have it, you wave it, right? You wave it. But I'm curious, does that, um, not, not does it affect your choices, but do you think that it affects the conversation we have about new work and, and who's responsible for what pieces of the process? I think it is hard to see the director's hand sometimes in new work. I know a lot of directors who I think are directors and dramaturgs. I know directors who work with dramaturgs. There's so many people, and do you feel like we get a sense, we the outsiders, we the watchers and reading reviews, that we really understand what a director does? There are three questions in everything. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to take that one first? <laughs> okay, <laughs> then I shall begin and then we can respond to it. Uh, it's very interesting, I have a very, um, a very, a very odd relationship with, with reviews. Um, as a playwright, I never read them, so I really, I, I probably read one, no, 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 let's not lie, I read three, and um, in my life, and I tend not to read them, because if they're great, you inhale, and you try to, in, you know, to do that again, and if they're bad, it knocks out the next play that you want to write for at least a few months. Um, so I tend to not want to do that. Um, in Britain, for instance, I don't know any reviewers personally, I don't go to opening nights. I deliberately not become part of that kind of club. As a director and as a, 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 an artistic director of an institution, it's my duty to read the press because it's part of, 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 of negotiating what it is your offering is. And so it becomes very, it becomes very, very hard, I think, to not listen to that very loud noise that is the reviewer. I think we're finding in the, in, 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 and I'm sure that you can, you, you can confirm or not even, that uh, in the world of the internet, where there's a review and then there are 20 comments underneath them, that, if we, that, that kind of is a really interesting world to be living in. Of course the 20 comments don't add up to the one bad review that you might have loved, or the one great review you may, but 
how we, how are we as, as, as the audience and as practitioners, often we go, oh, have you read that review? Have you heard about that play? We haven't gone over to wherever it is in the country to see it. Oh yeah, I heard it's not very good. And then we take it as gospel. How do we educate ourselves in the, in the theatre world to actually review reviews and to make sure that we understand them and can contextualise them, not just for us, but for our audiences as well. I had a wonderful thing at Centre Stage this year where two of the shows that have got the greatest reviews um, have taken the smallest amount of money. And one of them that got almost slaughtered took almost the most. Listening to the audience and listening to the review is a thing that we have to negotiate with. And we have to train ourselves and train our audiences, in my opinion. Who else wants to jump in on that? Um, it, I, I don't know really what to say. I mean, the thing is so complicated. You know, as an artistic director like Kwame, they have to be read. Um, uh, need to know the perceptions of the press on, on the work. Um, uh, on a personal level, I find them very, very, very difficult to deal with. Um, <clears throat> just because if they're good, they're never good enough. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> they, oh, well, you said it was wonderful. Why didn't he say amazing? And then, <laughs> and then if they're uh, negative, I, um, they're, they're deeply hurtful. Um, and I and I never have. How long have I been in this game? Um, Thirty-five years. I've never had any satisfactory way of negotiating that. And, and, a, and as, a, as an artist in growth, sorry, that's horrible, um, <laughs> on many levels. Um, I know I am sat next to you. Yeah, I don't find them, I, I find it very difficult to identify the ones that I think are helpful for what actually I do. And I don't, for the main part, look at them for that. I look to colleagues, my mentor, Max Stafford Clark, and whether, sorry, I've got to choke, actually whether my family would be proud of it. Um, and the reviews, and, and it's, it's, a, it's complicated, and it's very complex. And I think it's very hard for a lot of people, even in the profession, to identify, somebody would say, oh, this is badly directed, and you think, actually, I mean, that's a performance, or that is, or it's in the wrong context, or actually that's the play. Do you know what I mean? On how you pull it apart. Uh, there's a question there, that gentleman there. Thank you so much, sir. Hey, one minute in the microphone is coming to you. While that is doing, Jim, which does all good plays should do, shall we find ourselves back to where we were? <laughs> 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 This is a question that several of you personally know much more about than I do, so you can decide if there's anything embarrassing about it and deal with it. <laughs> I saw two productions, both of which I thought worked, both by the same director, both very, uh, each different from the other. One was done here a couple of years ago, directed by Sean Daniels, it was uh, Peterson Noctribe's Bob, and it was an extraordinarily elaborate production. My feeling at the time was that I kind of liked it, but thought that the elaborateness of the production was not called for by the script, and that it was probably put in by the director to help sell the play. The second one was done at Jiva Theatre in Rochester, directed by Sean Daniels, all different people except for the set designer, much scaled down, much smaller production, seeming to me to be closer to what the script must have been, though I haven't read the script. I never got a chance to talk to him about why he made these changes and how he felt about them. But they indicate something that we haven't really talked about here, which is, uh, that the director's approach to dealing with the author's script may not be a single thing. 
It may be a developing thing. And I don't know, you would know better than I, what's to be learned from this example. But the second production was strikingly smaller and more intimate and in a smaller theater. I can say it's interesting working here and as we're sitting on the set of the Delta Shore, a play that was not written to be performed in the round. So what we are doing to make that play work, we have a whole different set of dynamics that are not necessarily in the script. Like there's a staircase in the script that those three stairs are representing. So I think if suddenly we were doing it in a huge proscenium, I would approach it in a different way. I would actually approach staging dynamics in a different way. And I think in the case of Bob, that it is. It's like if you have these huge space that you have to fill, what that means, versus when you can look at something intimately. I mean, I sort of love that, when you can do multiple productions, because you keep learning about, like, ooh, I would keep that whole first scene, and then I would get rid of that whole table. You know, just like the things that you learn in watching it over again. Anybody else? Defense, you have a question. I think that, that Meredith's right that, that sometimes the decision is based on the, the space you're in, but also as a director, sometimes you just have to see something. Sometimes you just have to try something to learn whether or not it works, right? You can imagine whether or not you think it'll work till cows come home, but until you actually see it, until you actually see the actors try it, sometimes you just don't know. I also think, very honestly, I've directed only one play more than once, and that's, it was, I did two productions of Annie Baker's The Aliens, and, uh, it also is a thing where, like, Sean was probably a different person two years later. <laughs> and, you know, I was a different person when I directed The Aliens the first time and the second time, and I think there is undeniably something different that you bring to it, be it in terms of sensibility or just, like, what is your human connection to the story you're telling that um, is an ongoing evolution. And I would say um, what I got from that, because I think that's absolutely all that, right, is um, it made me think about trust about how much one trusts the text the first time out, and, and whether one needs to adorn it in order to, to punch out. And actually having seen it and lived with it, whether that director, or just even me with the other place, can actually trust the words to do the work for me, rather than the adornment. And that's a good lesson for me to think about as I step into the next new two new plays I'm about to direct. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now about one minute to one o'clock. I am getting a smile from our facilitator <laughs> as I wrap up. I'd just like to thank everybody for contributing. Um, wonderful questions, but most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you, not only for working in this field of new plays, which we know we don't often get the praises and the joys, um, but I really want to thank you for, for doing that, for us all doing it, and thank you everybody for this panel.